Every year, 53,000 people are diagnosed with skin cancer in the Netherlands. This number has only increased for the past 40 years. Of all cancer cases, one in three is skin cancer. There are three different types of skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma, or BCC, squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC, and melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most frequent type of skin cancer and the least aggressive. The chance of spreading or metastasis is small. Squamous cell carcinoma is after BCC, the most frequent type of skin cancer. Metastasis can occur, but often it is still curable. Melanoma is the least frequent type of skin cancer. It makes up 2% of all skin cancers. However, it is also the most aggressive type. Every year, 800 people die due to melanoma in the Netherlands. In this graph, the survival rate of melanoma is shown. As you can see, their survival depends on the stadium of the cancer and on how early it is detected. In this animation, we will discuss the origin of melanoma and the compromised function on a cellular level. Moles, or nevi, are often precursors of melanoma. However, not every nevus develops into a melanoma. Risk factors for this malignant transformation are a nevi phenotype, which means having over 100 moles, more than five atypical nevi, a fair skin type, a blonde or strawberry blonde hair color and blue eyes, freckles, and sun damage. In the first stadium, melanoma doesn't cause clear symptoms. Only in the fourth stadium, where metastases are also present, do distinct complaints occur. Nevi that are suspicious for melanoma are recognized by clinicians with the A, B, C, D, E method. Every letter of this method describes a characteristic of a melanoma. A stands for asymmetry. This means that the two halves of the mole do not match. B is border. The edges of the nevi could be irregular or uneven. The border could be scalloped, blurred or notched. C stands for color. The mole could be changing shades of brown, tan, black, red, blue, or even pink. D is diameter. A mole with a diameter of over six millimeters is suspicious for a melanoma. E stands for evolution. Did the mole change in size, shape, or color, or are there changes in symptoms such as bleeding, oozing, or itching? But from which cells do melanoma originate? Melanomas originate from melanocytes. Melanocytes are melanin-producing cells that lay in the stratum basal, the deepest layer of the epidermis. The melanin is taken up by keratinocytes, protecting them from sun damage. How melanin does this is not exactly known. Melanoma develops when a melanocyte gets multiple mutations, for example due to sun damage. These mutations make the melanocytes proliferate uncontrollably and eventually metastasize. In the case of melanoma, one mutation is often not enough to develop cancer. Most of the times, in the case of a driver mutation, the melanocytes will develop into a nevus, then stop growing. Only when there are multiple mutations, these nevi may develop into a malign melanoma. Melanoma is one of the cancers with the highest mutation frequency, as you can see in this graph. Melanoma is shown in red bars. This high mutation frequency is mainly due to UV damage. Communication within a cell is regulated by a vast number of proteins, which function through certain pathways. Dysregulation of these pathways results into dysfunction of these pathways. Dysregulation of growth and proliferation pathways is particularly important in the development of cancer. A pathway that is very often mutated in melanoma is the EGF pathway, which is important for cell proliferation. First, we will discuss how the pathway functions under normal circumstances. It starts when epidermal growth factor, EGF, binds to its receptor, EGFR, which is a single membrane spanning receptor with an intrinsic kinase domain. Upon ligand binding, the extracellular part of EGFR forms a dimer and the intracellular tails phosphorylate each other. This is called transphosphorylation. 
This way, EGFR becomes a docking site for a wide range of proteins, setting a signaling cascade in motion. One of the proteins that can bind to EGFR is GRAP2. GRAP2 has an SH2 domain. With this domain, it can interact with the phosphorylated tail of the EGF receptor. GRAP2 is always bound to SOS1. When the GRAP2 SOS1 complex is bound to EGFR, SOS1 gets activated and the entire EGFR GRAP2 SOS1 complex starts to search for two membrane bound RAS proteins, which is a GTPase. The first RAS protein needs to be already activated so SOS1 can undergo a conformational change. Now, SOS1 is able to bind an inactive RAS. After binding to this inactive RAS, SOS1 functions as a duanin exchange factor, a GEF. It removes the GDP bound to RAS, allowing RAS to bind GTP, which is far more abundant in the cell than GDP. When RAS is bound to GTP, it gets activated. This allows for it to bind BRAF, a kinase. BRAF is in its inactive state loosely bound to MEC, also a kinase. Two RAS proteins bind to two BRAF proteins, inducing dimerization of the BRAFs. This brings about a conformational change in the structure of BRAF, allowing it to bind ATP. BRAF does not need to be phosphorylated to become active. Now, BRAF can phosphorylate MEC. BRAF will hydrolyze ATP, so one of its phosphate groups is given to MEC. It will do this twice because BRAF can phosphorylate two residues, serine and threonine. MEC is now activated and attaches from BRAF. It will search for its binding partner, ERK, the third kinase in this pathway. Then, MEC phosphorylates ERK in the same way BRAF phosphorylated MEC. ERK will diffuse through the nuclear envelope in search of transcription factors. ERK can on its own phosphorylate amongst others ELK1, ELK4 and UND. Ultimately, this results in induction of expression of enzymes involved in gene replication, such as polymerases and helicases. This leads to growth and proliferation of the cell. This pathway can be dysfunctional in melanoma. Several proteins can be mutated. BRAF is most often mutated in melanomas, in 60% of the cases. Therefore, we will now focus on BRAF, the wild type, as well as a mutated type. This is wild-type BRAF. BRAF is a serine threonine kinase consisting of 766 amino acids. It is able to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on MEC. Structurally, BRAF can be divided into three parts called conserved regions or CR. Conserved region 1 can bind RAS. Conserved region 2 acts as a hinge between CR1 and CR3. Conserved region 3 can bind MEC and ATP. CR1 has two main functions. The first is the binding of RAS, which is needed for activation. The second function is auto-inhibition of CR3. This way, ATP cannot bind and MEC cannot get phosphorylated. CR2 is a bridge between CR1 and CR3 and can bind to a protein called 1433. This protein acts as a lock to keep BRAF in its inactive conformational state. 1433 needs to get phosphorylated by a kinase in order to bind to BRAF. CR3 contains the MEC kinase domain and can bind to ATP. This is the molecular structure of CR3 when it is inactive. It has two lobes, the N lobe and the C lobe. The N lobe has the ATP binding pocket or catalytic residue as shown in green. In its inactive state, ATP cannot reach into the binding pocket due to two things. Firstly, the binding domain for ATP is disorganized and cannot recognize ATP to bind it. Secondly, hydrophobic bonds are formed around the binding pocket, preventing ATP from entering. The C lobe has the MEC binding domain or activation segment as shown in orange. When inactive, this activation segment is disorganized as well. MEC is not recognized either and can therefore not bind. Now let's look at how BRAF gets activated. The first thing that needs to happen is the removal of the protein 1433. In order for this to happen, a phosphatase needs to be activated by an active RAS. 
deactivated phosphatase removes a phosphate group of one side of the 1433 protein, thereby freeing CR2. The second step is the binding of CR1 to RAS and the loose binding of CR3 to MEC. The RAS-CR1 bonding results in the dimerization of two BRAF complexes. This induces a conformational change in the CR3 kinase domain. This way, both the ATP binding pocket, shown in green, and the MEG binding site, shown in red, get organized. MEG can now strongly bind to its activation segment. Moreover, the hydrophobic bonds destabilize and break, opening the cleft. ATP can now enter its binding pocket and bind. MEG gets phosphorylated by BRAF and the signaling cascade can proceed. 60% of melanomas have a BRAF mutation, of which 90% is a V600E mutation. This means that on position 600 of the amino acid chain, which is in CR3, a valine is substituted by a glutamic acid. Valine is neutrally charged, while glutamic acid has a negative charge. Therefore, this mutation interferes with two things. Firstly, the hydrophobic bonds in the ATP catalytic cleft are disrupted, and secondly, it organizes the residues that can phosphorylate MEC and can bind to ATP. Normally, this only happens when BRAF is dimerized. In the mutated BRAF, it doesn't have to get dimerized after binding by RAS in order for it to bind to ATP and MEC. Because BRAF is constantly active, it is called a gain-of-function mutation. Traditionally, Metastatic melanoma was difficult to cure. Because melanoma is most often detected in the fourth stadium when the cancer has already spread, resection is not an option. However, this knowledge about the molecular mechanisms of the pathway, in particular about BRAF, has led to the development of new targeted therapies. The most effective kind of targeted therapy are ATP competitive inhibitors of the kinase domain of BRAF, such as vemurafenib and dabrafenib. These ATP competitive inhibitors bind to the ATP binding pocket of V600E mutated BRAF, preventing ATP to bind to it, so BRAF cannot phosphorylate and thus activate MEC. These inhibitors have a higher affinity for mutated BRAF in comparison to wild-type BRAF. Because of this, these inhibitors bind mostly to V600E BRAF while minimally affecting wild-type BRAF. This allows for high exposures of the drug while avoiding toxic side effects of BRAF inhibition, giving the drug a large therapeutic window. Paradoxically, these inhibitors promote dimerization and thereby activation of wild-type BRAF. The mechanism behind this is not entirely clear. These kind of targeted therapies have improved survival rates significantly. For example, vemurafenib has shown to give complete or partial remission in 81% of V600E mutated melanoma patients. Use of vemurafenib gives a longer median survival, disease stabilization, and in some cases even dramatic regression. The brafenib showed similar results. However, almost 1 in 5 patients with this BRAF mutation do not respond to treatment as a result of intrinsic resistance, and almost all patients who do respond will eventually develop acquired resistance. Due to this resistance, the tumor will grow and spread again. In more than 70% of the cases, the resistance is caused by reactivation of the MAP kinase pathway. This can happen through several mechanisms. Firstly, BRAF itself can get spliced, resulting in a new mutation or an amplification. Secondly, proteins downstream in the pathway can get mutated. For instance, MEC can get mutated in order for it to become BRAF independently activated. A third possibility is mutated proteins upstream in the pathway. RAS can be mutated to constantly activate BRAF or to activate other signaling cascades, such as the PI3K AX pathway. This pathway targets alike transcription factors and thus has similar consequences, namely cell proliferation. A fourth mechanism of resistance is receptor tires and kinase hyperactivation. Hyperactivation of these receptors results in overstimulation of the RAS BRAF MAP kinase pathway or results in activation of other pathways, such as, again, the PI3K AX pathway. 
Because resistance is such a big problem in the treatment of melanoma, clinical research is now focused on combination therapy. This way, multiple proteins in the signaling pathway can be inhibited, making the chance of acquiring resistance smaller. The combination of BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors has shown significant improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival, in addition to less side effects. This is because MEK inhibitors diminish the paradoxical MEK activation that BRAF inhibitors cause. One of the first combination therapies used in clinical research was the brafinib and trametinib, a MEK inhibitor. This gave very promising results. When given the brafinib alone, in only 9% of the patients, the tumor did not grow in one year, while when given both drugs, this was the case for 41% of the patients. Other combination therapies have shown similar results. Another very promising type of therapy in melanoma is immunotherapy, in which the patient's own immune system is activated to fight the cancer. At the moment, the challenge is to find combinations of therapies using traditional chemotherapy, targeted therapy or immunotherapy, harboring the best results with the least side effects. The increase in therapeutical options makes it more and more easy to find you in the treatment per patient. However, although the median survival has improved drastically thanks to new therapeutical options, metastatic melanomas are still almost always eventually lethal. Hopefully, using our ever-increasing knowledge about the molecular mechanisms, even more and better therapies will become available, making it one day possible to cure metastatic melanoma.